at UFC 238, the table is set for a huge main event as flyweight champ Henry the Messenger Cejudo moves up to face Magic Marlon Moraes for the vacant bantamweight title. After defeating Demetrius Johnson and TJ Dillashaw in consecutive matchups, Henry Cejudo knocks TJ Dillashaw round one. Cejudo is now looking to cement his name in the history books by becoming a two division UFC title holder. Standing in his way, however, is one of the standout stars of 2018. Marlon Moraes has been a wrecking ball at 135 pounds, putting together an impressive four fight win streak. Big kick, and that is it! Magic Marlon Moraes! After proving himself more than ready to face the best in the division, he'll be looking to put on a show and get his hands on UFC gold at the United Center in Chicago. Hello and welcome to UFC Inside the Octagon, your ultimate fight breakdown service. John Gooden alongside expert analyst Dan Hardy. Today, we are going to be talking about the main event for UFC 238 for the vacant bantamweight title between Henry Cejudo, the current flyweight champion, and the number one contender, Marlon Moraes. Dan, this is a big fight. Some clarity now at the top of the division, now that we have the absence of TJ Dillashaw. Are you excited about this one? I am excited because I always feel like Cejudo was planning on moving up to bantamweight anyway. You know, his, his first fight in the UFC was at bantamweight. He's missed weight a couple of times. And I mean, you know, fair play for him to, you know, get that under control and get the, the flyweight title. But he's destined to move up a weight class. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's a heavily muscled individual for his height. And I feel like, you know, that, that cut down to, the, down to the weight class is going to be finite. You know, he's going to be good at this weight class. And as soon as he had that, flyweight strap mm -hmm. put around his waist. He was calling for the bantamweight title yeah. at that very moment. Marlon Moraes, definitely the right man to be contending for the title? Absolutely, absolutely. Especially after that stoppage over a Sun Tzu. He came into the UFC with so much steam. A lot of people were excited. He got a Sun Tzu immediately. He was straight up into the top yeah. five, you know? It's a tough a, first fight. Yeah, and, and after that, it was consistently tough fights, and he's just performed. I mean, yeah, yeah he's had a, a couple of difficult ones, but after that, he's, he's looked so strong, and I feel like, you know, with, the, with the, the state of the bantamweight division at the moment, he's the one clear contender that, that is deserving of a title shot. Right, well, he's under the spotlight today, but let's set it up with the facts and the stats. We see the gold, obviously the flyweight gold. This is bantamweight that is up for grabs, if you like. Right, physically, Marais, as you would expect, probably the more natural or the bigger mm. man, would you say? Yeah, I would class? say so. And what's, what's, what's going to be strange for him is that normally he's the smaller man in there as well. He started his career earlier, you know, at, at featherweight, and he was undersized a lot of the time. And, you know, even in this division now, he's still fighting guys that, that seemingly quite a bit bigger than him. But he, you know, he, his speed in this division is ridiculous. That's where this gets interesting for me. It's less about who's the bigger man and who's about who's the faster. I'm really excited to see who comes out on top in that one. That could be a fact. He and is if, an Olympic gold medalist. And if no one has heard that, <laughs> he is an Olympic gold medalist. Yeah. He likes to say that, as would I, yeah. if I had... I, I, did, I did want to put it as all three of the stats, but yeah. uh, the, the UFC If you guys. follow Henry, then you would understand his humour <laughs> with that one. I think that the team actually watched his show, so I mm. uh, hope cool. they enjoy this one. And also, that was huge. When you beat... A lot of people would believe, like, the pound-for-pound pound guys yeah. as well. Yeah. He did that. And, and the other thing as well is it, it's not, it's not that, that he defeated him, it's how he defeated him. I feel like, you know, if he'd have come out and starched DJ in the first round, people would have demanded a rematch because then that would have been one apiece. Yeah. But because he came out and he shut DJ down after having a, a hard early start, I feel like it further justified him as, as the, the flyweight champion with that performance. Yeah, OK, well, I'm excited about looking at Marlon Moraes because we haven't taken a, a deep dive into this gentleman thus far. And well, with that, then, let's turn back the clock, shall we? Shall okay. we see the evolution of, from what he was to where he is now? Yeah. The, the, one, the thing that stands out to me, especially if you go all the way back to his Shuto Brazil fights, is that technically he was very good. The, 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 the technical aspects of his game, the delivery of his shots, the delivery of his strikes, the, the understanding of the ground game was very good. Low kicks in particular was the thing that stood out. This is actually at the Nova and Yao gym. I've actually, uh, I've actually watched Aldo sparring in this ring. It's... Uh, Bit, bit of a legendary place, but you can see that there was a recklessness to his style and aggression to his style, which sometimes worked out really well for him. Other times it, 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 it had him running into brawls where he was taking shots he didn't need to. So his early career it was a little up and down. I mean, he was four and four after his first two fights. 
But if you look back at those early fights, it, it's understandable why, because there was no patience, there was no maturity to the way you used to fight. But you look at the Jimmy Rivera fight now, and this is the epitome of patience in a fight. It was beautiful, he was circling, he was fainting. He wasn't even really necessarily throwing a great deal. He was using feints and footwork to get his reads. Just testing, just dropping forward, feinting with the jab. He, he knew that kick was there, and, and he was just waiting for Jimmy Rivera to be in the right place to do it. Whereas you go back 10 years when he was fighting in Chuto, Brazil, and he can't wait to get drawn into a brawl. You know what I mean? He's just, he just runs at people. It, it, was, it, it, it was almost, he did himself a disservice by being too reckless. Right. Now he's been able to pull that back a little bit. And I think part of it is the camp that he's with, being able to you know, harness that, that potential. And also the people that he's working with as well. You can see echoes of his teammates in his game. And yeah. I think he's basically becoming the combination of all the best best pieces of that camp. Yeah, shouts out to Barbosa as well and those yeah. kicks. They spend mm. a lot of time together. There's evidence there. Um, so Cejudo is moving up from flyweights. If you listen to him, he believes he will be the heavier man mm -hmm. on the night over Marlon Moraes. But in doing so, coming up from a lighter weight class, what do you think are the advantages or, or something key that he might be bringing across to bantamweights? Well, I, I think speed, and I think speed in a straight line as well. He's very, very fast moving forward, covering distance, as, as you would expect to, you know, as a, as a high-level wrestler. So I think speed moving into the into range is going to be a big key for him. Also, hand speed. You know, we've seen in, in many of his fights that, you know, especially at flightweight, when he's dealing with guys that are already very, very fast, his hand speed can be quite overwhelming. Right. I mean, he's yeah. lightning fast, very, very quick. And I don't feel like that's going to drop off a great deal by him moving up because the majority of the weight that he's going to be carrying in that fight is walking around within training camp anyway because yeah. he's cutting that to get to flyweight. So I feel like he's going to be very, very quick in this, in this division. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind as well, look at this piston of a, of a right hand that he lands. Bang! I mean, that is pinpoint accurate. You can see he's taken to the striking like he, like he approached his wrestling. You know, he was, he was a, a, such a high-level wrestler. He understands what it takes to achieve a high level in something. And he's dedicated himself to the strike as well, the, the, the footwork and the understanding of range. I, I think he's a very, very talented fighter. And, and I think that moving up to this weight class, we're going to see his speed accentuated. And the one other thing that's worth considering as well is because he's such a high-level wrestler, he's not bothered about charging forward because he can either find his way into a clinch or someone's going to be foolish enough to level change and try and take yep. him down, and then you're in his game. So, you know, that, that's, that's, there's even more reason for him to be, to be putting his foot on the gas when he's moving forward. Yeah, love how he's evolved as well. Even changing up his stance. It's, yeah. uh, it's been beautiful to see. Yeah, that karate yeah. style. We'll get into that in a bit. Yeah. Mm. Um, OK, so if he's coming with such pace and, and fury, how do you slow him down? Well, you've got to slow him down. You've got to take his wheels away. You know, the one thing that we've seen from Marlon Moraes is that he's got excellent low kicks. And when he came into the UFC, people were talking about his low kicks. But we can't, un we can't underestimate the whole, the whole variety of his game. One of the reasons why his low kicks are so effective is because he's got a well-rounded Muay Thai game as it is. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, he can set up his low kicks with feints, the faint jab, stings. He's very good at... at, at transitioning through range and making people think he's going to throw something different. But then at the same time, when he does start to throw something and it gets effect, he's very good at punishing people for it. I do just want to show you this, because this is, this is, this shows you his understanding of range like nothing else, in my opinion. When someone understands how to roll under a punch and get your head out of danger, especially at the tightness that he rolls under this punch, watch how close he is when he rolls under that arm. I mean, you can even see that a Sun Sao drops his elbow to try and catch him as he's disappearing underneath his arm. It's, it's, it's quite special. It reminds me of Canelo Alvarez when he fought Miguel Cotto. Did the same thing. Watch this. So a Sun Sao's throwing the hand. He's going to come with the left hook, and Morais is underneath it before he even starts to throw it. There comes the left hook. He passes underneath. I mean, look how close he is right there. That's quick. And you can see a Sun Tzu feels him going underneath and he starts to drop the elbow. He's starting to drop the elbow to try and catch him. And Marais is still out of the way. I mean, that is fast. That is, a, that is an understanding of range and reaction time that, that very, very few people have in the sport of mixed martial arts. And he does it consistently as well. It's not like it's the only time he does it. His ability to get his head off the centre line and deliver power punches is going to be a real, a real effect, uh, effective technique in this fight with Cejudo travelling forward in such a, such a fast pace. And then, you know, in his last few fights, we've seen him, we've seen him just step to a level of striking that is, 
I mean, I think it's nearly unparalleled in this division. I don't think many people have got the ability and the striking prowess that he's got. And, and we this, keep doing this, Dan. Well, we keep doing it. I, I know, love this I celebration. It's brilliant. I know, it's, it is beautiful. And this is, this is something that is really worth focusing on. So we saw the Aljamain Sterling fight, and we, uh, we spoke about this in the Anthony Smith Gustafson breakdown about the ability to throw a kick and land at various different stages of the leg and still be dangerous. So this is the Aljamain Sterling one. He caught him right on the knee as Al Aljamain Sterling was coming into range, okay? So we've seen that one. The Jimmy Rivera kick was almost exactly the same. The only difference was that Jimmy Rivera wasn't moving into range at the same time. Look at that. That's the same delivery of the kick. So you've got, let me, uh, Let's use, let's use the yellow so it stands out in the monster thing. So we've got the base foot's planted there, base foot's planted there, right? It's almost like spot the difference. Remember that game, John? I do. You can see the legs being brought from behind here, so it's coming through. But the difference in both of these is that Jimmy Rivera is probably a foot away from his knee, which is going to allow the rest of the leg to extend out and catch him across the top of the head. Mm. Whereas at this point, it stops there because Aljamain Sterling's already met the, met the force of the kick. It's exactly the same technique, but dangerous in so many different ranges. So how do you, how do you stop that? So you've heard about like crowding the kick. <laughs> uh-huh. But I think that's what Aljamain was trying to do in a yeah. way, and he got caught with the knee on the way through. So is there a... Yeah, that's the difference between a, between a Muay Thai kick, a traditional Muay Thai kick. Because what you're doing with, with a Muay Thai kick is instead of bringing, like with a Taekwondo kick, you turn through and you snap the kick out. Yep. With Muay Thai, you bring the knee through first. So if somebody's moving towards you, you can stop them with that shin there. Yeah. Like, if you ever watch a, a Thai boxer kick in the bag, they should be denting the bag at a 45-degree angle. Right. Because you're bringing the kick up and you're hitting, almost like you're hitting with an elbow. Yeah. And that's the effect of this, is the first thing that you're going to meet is the knee. If you're, if you're further out of range, you're going to get hit with the kick. And you've got to think, if Henry Cejudo's so fast moving forward, he might not have time to catch him with the head kick, but if the knee's there to meet him, yeah. that's a very dangerous thing to be running onto. And we've seen it be so effective several times. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely work, that. Right. And we've got more lovely work to be analysing in just a second. That is coming up after the break. <music> Welcome back to UFC Inside the Octagon, where we're talking about the main event for UFC 238 for the vacant bantamweight title between Magic Marlon Moraes and the messenger, Henry Cejudo. So, Dan, we've been talking some strategy for Magic Marlon. Let's go across to the red corner now, shall we? And... What do you think that we could be seeing from Henry Cejudo? Well, as I, as I talked about in the first half, th that sprint forward moving into range is going to be really useful for Cejudo because he is a very fast individual, got fast hands. But as I said, part of the reason why he's, he's comfortable doing that is because if he ends up in the clinch, that's not necessarily a bad thing for a, an Olympic gold medalist freestyle yes. wrestler. I mean, he, <laughs> in the clinch, he is dangerous. And he has adapted it to suit MMA as well. Like When he finds his way into the clinch now, he understands how to utilise striking as well as head position to start either buckling people's posture, you know, he works to the knee, to works the midsection to the knee to bring the head down, to snap the head down for the front headlock. Or the other thing is he works the knee to the body to get them to bring their hips in so he can do the outside and inside reap. This is, this is by far his best technique, in my opinion. His, his takedowns with, with, from this position are just dangerous. And what you'll see him do is he, he looks for that back foot. That's the best example of it. Let me just show you what I'm seeing here, what he's doing. What Henry's looking at at the moment is DJ's back foot. You can see his eye line. He's looking right down at where his back foot is. Okay, He's paying attention to that because his favoured technique is the inside reap with the right leg. So what he wants her, um, DJ to do is to put his weight on that foot to step forward. And he controls him very well by doing this. Good with the clinch, moves through, he gets one step look, and he pulls him. You can see that little pull to get that second step, and then the third step. I mean, it's just like, you, you can see him just guiding, guiding DJ into that moment, into that, uh, that trip. Beautifully timed, beautifully placed, beautifully executed. And the thing is, even, even when DJ started to realise that he was use, utilising that technique, he started to adapt it. He started to be able to reach further with it, cover more distance. I mean, that is... Look how he's hooking the leg. Look how he hooks the leg really high on this one. You need 
absolute confidence in that technique to commit to it in that way. Absolute confidence. Because you, you commit your whole body weight to it, especially in a high-level fight like this where you know GJ is going to bail out. Look at that. Lifts high with the underhook. Lifts high with the underhook. Hooks around the back of this leg. He's coming around the back and hooking that leg, so he's taking that base away. But at the same time, you can see he's collapsing his whole body weight mm. onto DJ. He's forcing him down to the mat. I mean, you, you can see the trajectory of this movement, but it's all dependent on him controlling this leg. And the, the, thing, the thing is, DJ is very smart. DJ got to the stage where he started to adapt. So you can see Henry's hooking, but this is an even better adaptation. Let me just slow this down. You can see it there perfectly. So, what DJ had started to do was realize, as Cejudo was going for that leg, that he was able to step it out if he was quick enough. So that's what we see him do here. So same thing again. Cejudo wants this leg here. He wants the inside reap with the left this time. As this progresses forward, watch this. Cejudo hooks the leg. He's got it. But then DJ takes his weight off it immediately. He lifts his leg out of it. And as he goes to place it back down, the hook of Cejudo is already there to catch the base and settle him on the floor. So he's got another follow-up. It's a second and a third. And this, yeah. this is more, that's more of a fundamental understanding of wrestling than a technical one. Mm. And this is something I've actually learned doing this breakdown, is that there are, there are different stages that you go to when you're learning techniques. And when you get to that highest level of technique, like when Bruce Lee used to talk about, you know, I don't strike, it hits all by itself. That's when, that's when the technique's instinctual and fundamental. Yeah. And, and, and what Henry Cejudo is able to do in the moment is adapt his takedown because he understands the fundamentals of breaking a human down to the floor. Not the technical aspects of if this single leg doesn't work, I go to a knee tap if that doesn't... Sure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He's not going from one technique to another. He's taking one base away and then removing the next base away, solving one problem after the next with things that are presenting themselves in the moment. That's... That's the highest level of wrestling. So in part one of the show, you were talking about Marlon Moraes using the low kick. And at that range then, what does Cejudo have? Uh, well, catching the kicks. Right. First and foremost, a part of the benefit of him being so fast in moving forward is that not only is he able to go over kicks with punches, which is going to be a problem, but he's also able to catch kicks and run people over. And like we said with the inside reap takedowns, when he goes, he commits. He's very, very aggressive with that commitment, and he can chain things together. I mean, this is a perfect example. He catches the kick here and drives through, but DJ defends the first shot, so he has to go to the inside reap. Like, being adaptable in the moment is going to be really key for this one, and there's, a, there's a, a reason why that's important, because of the way that Marlon Moraes throws his low kicks, which I'm going to get into in a second. But you can see DJ there. Well, this, this is a good example of why I need to illustrate the way Marlon Moraes throws his kicks. So what we see here is DJ's throwing his body weight fully, he's fully committing into this kick. You see, see how square his hips are when the kick lands? Bang, and then his hips square back, and that's the point where he starts to collapse over because his hips are square, he's got no base behind him, and you can see he's hooking that lead leg and he's powering over with the yeah. right hand, so that's not only a punch, but that's a weight that will drive him to the floor. But because there's no base behind him, there's no opportunity for... Uh, DJ to stop that forward momentum or turn to get out of it. And that's, that's where Marlon Moraes throws his kicks differently. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful adjustment that he makes and it could be really key in this fight. So if Moraes does get taken down, from my understanding and my looking back, he's got a couple of really nice tricks if it goes there. Yes. I'm not sure if he can use them against Cejudo, but what do you think? Well, I, I agree, I agree. And I, and I, do think, I do think his first line of attack is getting the kick caught and then attacking, forcing a scramble. Because it, the thing is, you, you have to adapt to people's timing. This is the first thing I expect to see. If, if he starts throwing kicks and Cejudo starts catching kicks, I expect Marais to immediately start attacking legs, create a scramble, and then get back to his feet. The one thing that he doesn't want to do is create a scramble where he's not attacking because he'll end up giving his back to Cejudo. Right. And that's the last place that you want Cejudo because he can stay there all day. Okay. So I feel like him being aggressive in these, in these moments is even better. The second line of defence, if, say if he does get taken down, he needs to create those scrambles, of course. He's got quite average, statistically quite average. Yeah, it's like 60 something well. percent, isn't yeah. it? It's not. But then again, I mean, if you've, got, if you've got attacks, then, you know. It doesn't always matter. It doesn't always matter. So this, this is a body kick. The body kick's coming in. We've got Dodson's going to catch it here, but the, immediately, as soon as Marlon Marais feels like the kick's caught, okay, there we go. 
So the ankle's caught there. Do you see how Morice brings the knee across immediately? Yeah. He's putting the foot on the, on the waistline so he can kick him away, but he's, the second line of defence is, is the shin across the waistline. And as he turns his, his body away, he's keeping the tie clinch with his right hand, and he's going to hit him straight away with a power left. Nice. Bang. The top half of his body stayed one way, right? his, his hips were <laughs> rotating That's it, but that, that's the dexterity that I see yeah. in, in a lot of his kicks, which is going to be a problem for Cejudo, catching kicks. I mean, that was a spinning elbow off the back of that. He throws the kick, and then he turns his body and runs out of it, like somebody was attacking an ankle lock. Yeah. What do they say when someone's attacking an ankle lock? Turn and yeah. sprint, right? Kick him up the ass, turn and sprint. That's exactly what you're doing. It's the same thing with a, with a cat, kick catch. You kick them away, and you turn and you run. And the last thing that, you, that you've got to be bearing in mind if you're Henry Cejudo is he's got a wicked neck attack game. He almost got Dodson with it. I feel like Dodson was saved by the bell, but a Sun Sao in the rematch was absolutely not saved by the bell. Mm. And that's a big statement, subbing a Sun Sao like that. Yes. You know? You, you've got to think if, if Cejudo comes up this weight class, he starts to slow down towards the championship rounds because he's not used to carrying the extra 10 pounds in competition. Marlon Moraes is still there. He's defending a few takedowns now, and Cejudo's driving, driving, driving and he clamps onto that guillotine. He learnt the lesson pulling guard against Dodson. He's not going to do that again. He'll take top position, and he'll get the, they'll get the finish there. Yeah. But, I mean, does Henry Cejudo get tired at this weight class? That's the question. I think he's going to be able to keep a pace for 25 minutes. Yeah, I agree. Well, on Cejudo, one thing that has impressed me no end is he was, was he the youngest uh, American wrestler yes, to, to yeah. achieve gold at the Olympics. So that's a huge accomplishment. Even to get there, he's gone through a bunch of different stuff nationally. And then he's redefined himself as a mixed martial artist. And he gets the belt. Mm -hmm. And again, he's going to go again mm -hmm. to get a belt at a different weight class. That is an unbelievable, ambitious mind that is just the appetite for competition and for learning and reskilling is unbelievable. Yeah, it, it, it is. But then, you know. <laughs> Someone that, someone that has, has developed a game in wrestling like, like Cejudo did, that has then decided to turn their attention to something else, they're going to approach it with the same kind of tenacity. And, and I think that he's a, he's a very astute individual, he's a problem solver, so I would think that any time he's met any kind of resistance in his fights, like Chico Camus defended all of his takedowns, but that wasn't necessarily because it was, they were poor takedowns, that was because there was a problem with his weight cut. Like, he, was, he had a really bad weight cut for that fight. So that was a problem that he solved. He solved that problem now. Mm. He stepped on the scales at championship weight. He's done that twice. He looked healthy doing it. You know, he walked away with the belt the second time around. Like, that's the kind of mindset that he's got, that if he meets resistance, he'll go away, he'll figure out a way of solving it, and he'll come back. What I'm interested in is how he solves the low kick problem that we saw in the DJ fight, because I think that's even more of an issue against Marlon Moraes. Yeah. You know, a weight class bigger, heavier kicks, notoriously a very good uh, low kick game. You've got to hope that Cejudo's already figured out a solution to that before he goes into this fight. We didn't see it in the TJ fight, yeah. but Maurice will certainly test that. his work done yeah. super quick. Right, that's it, yeah. So I think he's aiming for, like, pound for pound, number one, and... Uh, yeah. Right. He'll be calling that DC next. <laughs> I think he already has done. Yeah, if probably. he could make the weight, he probably would do. <laughs> uh, but what a fantastic matchup that is for the vacant bantamweight gold. Excellent stuff. We do have an Inside the Octagon Extra where we talk more things UFC 238, so make sure you check that one out. For now, we are done, but we will, of course, be back with the next big fight right here at Inside the Octagon. Thank you for watching.